Management has changed a lot in, since the, I'm going to age myself here, but since the 20 years that I've been doing it, uh, the, the skills required, the kind of expectations, even the understanding, the, the core understanding of what a product manager does has changed in that time. So I'm really excited that we've got places like Product School. As you can see, I actually also teach product management at Berkeley, which is uh, a first uh, for, for UC Berkeley to have an undergraduate level product management course, uh, which went from a pilot of about 20 students about five years ago to one of the most popular elective courses. We actually have, now have to survey people and interview them before we let them take the course. So it's, uh, it's, it's really great to see places like this sort of really trying to convey and educate and, and upskill sort of product uh, people and to drive greater awareness of what product managers actually do. So today, I'm actually going to talk a little bit about a, a, a little bit of a difficult topic, but it's going to kind of a bit more of a soft topic, if you will, about what it's like to actually think like a product manager. So no, it's not about processes or development processes or analytics or anything. This is more about like getting into the right mindsets so you can apply yourself in your, in your role in many different ways to essentially uh, make ideas within your organization more robust, solutions better, and to make sure that you're taking risk out of what, uh, of what you're guiding your, your organization to do, as well as driving focus. So that's basically what I'm going to introduce. It's sort of my version of design thinking, if you will, product management thinking. Uh, and I'll show you a couple of frameworks that hopefully should simplify for you and then a couple of examples of how of actual activities that product managers do. Fairly broad, uh, but we'll also try to apply some of that and then of course I'm really uh, interested in answering questions and I'd love to make this interactive as well. So we'll do a couple of exercises, but I don't, don't hesitate to interrupt me. Uh, if, you've got a, if you've got a burning question, and the worst is I'll, I'll either say you will, we're coming to that or I'll, I'll be able to give you an answer. Um, but before we get too much further, uh, can I get a show of hands? How many are actual PMs today in an organization? Okay, actual product managers today. Nice and high. So very few. How many are aspiring product managers who wish to be product managers, learning the skills? Great. Okay, that, that really helps um, so I know what, where to target. Uh, any others, like engineers who want to figure out how to work better with product managers? Any of those? Uh-huh, good. Designers who want to figure out? Good, good, that's good to see. Um, well, let's, let's actually start. Uh, do you know who this character is, by the way? Droopy. Droopy Dog? Yeah, Droopy's going Droopy, to come through with the journey with us today. Uh, he's doing my favorite activity in this. He's got a martini glass drinking away. So I promise you I haven't had more than zero before coming here today. So I should be, should be in pretty good stead. So uh, to start, let's actually uh, take out your phone. I'm assuming you've all got smartphones. Uh, pick your second favorite application. So your second favorite application. Uh, you, ideally a niche product. So something that probably you don't use too often, other people wouldn't know about or, or, or do or don't use very often. And then let's, let's get noisy. Uh, turn to your neighbor and you can be the person in front of you, next to you, whatever. And uh, take turns to tell your neighbor the following four things. Number one, and I'm sorry it's a bit of an eye chart for the folks in the back, so I'll read out nice and loudly. Number one, convince them that they need to be using the application. Sell it to them. Why would, you, why would you do this? Why would you download this and go to the trouble of actually using the application? Secondly, identify with your neighbor a metric or a business or a user metric that you'd be curious to measure, like to learn more about whether, whether or not this application is actually working. And, and then third, imagine what more you wish the app could do for you. Where is it lacking? And then finally, critique something that you really don't like about it. All right. Okay, do I need to read those again or do you want to go for it? Go. Good. Huh? A any, any product, any product you like.
like to get them all like interactive over time. Oh yeah, that's that's a, that's a very good way to start. May not be working for them. You'll edit it, right? Yeah. No, no. Yeah. All right, just two more minutes. One more minute. One more minute. It's okay, it's okay. So, so it looks like some of you really got into it and, and, and uh, didn't give the other, the other person a chance, so that's okay. Okay, at the back there. So, so uh, in the interest of time, we'll move on. I know some of you didn't get a chance to like show your stuff. Uh, but essentially, that's, that's what product managers do, these four things. Okay, and I'm going to show you uh, a framework that you can sort of take away and then we'll talk a little bit more in depth about what these kind of things. But what did you notice about these questions? Anybody? Anybody? Anything that stood out to you? Convincing people they should do something is not easy. Convincing people that they should do something is not easy. That is absolutely, absolutely the case. Uh, it, even if it's in their interest. <laughs> yeah. Right, so that's showing that you've got to sometimes hold contradictory thoughts, right? So you've got to be simultaneously uh, uh, talking about the positives of a product by, while you're also thinking about where, what, what assumptions might I be making that are wrong? What things could go wrong? What risks do I actually have? And you've got to be able to kind of cross over those different kind of mindsets pretty seamlessly. Otherwise, you will end up pushing something potentially that's not going to be, uh, not going to work. Or, sec or secondly, if you only look at the negatives, of course, you won't be successful because people won't buy into your vision and, and join you on that journey. But I think if you don't say the negatives, then you're like, this, this application will save your life. And then I'm immediately, no. Yes, exactly. And it's about credibility, right? So being able to have, a d a, to basically show that you can be objective. I can be objective, I can tell you the positives and negatives, I can, I can look for things that I don't know, I can evangelize, I can criticize and critique my own, my own product, uh, and I can identify ways to, to uh, discover new solutions and imagine things. So let me actually show you a very simple uh, framework. Imagine that there's a, just two axes. I used to do consulting, so everything is a two by two matrix. On one end, you've got like this very creative, imagining possibilities, like 
being able to suspend reality a little bit and saying there's all these different wonderful things that we could do. And it's about going for volume of ideas. It's about uh, trying to uh, f figure out possibilities without necessarily thinking about the constraints that you have. Brainstorming is a great example of that. But on the other end of the scale, you've got like inspect. This is where you actually need to look at cold, hard data and say, what do I, what do I need to learn? What do I need to understand about either my product or about the market so I'm actually making better decisions? And overlay that with, with a, a fairly simple way of thinking about your thinking. Divergent thinking is I'm going big, broad, I'm thinking of lots of different paths. And convergent thinking is I'm focusing in on something and I've picked a place to go and now I need to actually really button down and go deep on that one thing. So broad, deep, divergent, convergent. So those are, those are obviously uh, opposites and you need to do them all. So let's talk about what each of these quadrants might be in turn. The first is you've got this sort of explorer mindset. And your goal as a product manager at that point is to expand your solution space or the possibilities of what you could do with some creative thinking. Uh, there's plenty of different examples there. I'll, show, I'll, I'll share some. Uh, so for example, I, I like to call this as kind of the dreamer mode. Uh, one, of, one of the key things that you can do to actually enable this is to define a broad, lofty, exciting, uh, product vision. There are many different ways you can do this. You obviously can pitch, you can write something, put together a, a, a communication. Uh, one of the most powerful ways that I've found, particularly for more visual oriented people, is to actually mock up the end state of your product and show it what it, can, might, it could be at the end of it all. Obviously it's not a design requirement, but it's sort of communicating where you could be. Another uh, important thing that you need to do is don't lock in on one solution too early. One of the biggest rookie mistakes of product managers is to come up with a solution first without really understanding a lot more about the problem space, the opportunities, and multiple potential solutions. So don't lock in too early. Uh, canvassing is, 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 I'm using that word on purpose because your job as a product manager isn't actually necessarily to have ideas. I, I don't know many organizations that are, actually have a lack of ideas. Generally, there's a lot of people in those organizations, the founders, the entrepreneurs, the creative types, the engineers, the designers, your customers, all actually have ideas about where your product should go. So your job is actually to go and figure out where those ideas are, to capture them, to understand them, to communicate them, to track them. And that's why I think it's important that you you spend a lot of time just sort of canvassing broadly, building relationships with people in your organization and, and around you to try to understand uh, what, uh, what's out there. And uh, that is related to, don't be afraid to borrow from other products. A, a product manager is, is naturally curious about product experiences. That's one thing I kind of look for. If you're into products and you're trying to figure out how they work and you, you notice things like user experiences that make onboarding fun and interesting, for example, or you notice things that just don't, that turn you off a product. Try to keep track of those sorts of things, those sort of wow factors or those sorts of things that you don't want to repeat and, and don't be afraid to borrow liber liberally from other products. Now, that includes your competitors. Don't be afraid of that. And that also includes uh, looking at adjacent products or products that may not be exactly your industry, but might be, say, for example, appealing to your target audience. So they've kind of figured out like things that are interesting to your target audience. Or it might even just be the same business model. And then fourth, uh, this is always challenging, but if it's... Th to hold out on locking in behind one solution for as long as possible, uh, I'll t I'll t there's, a, there's a point at which you don't want to do that too long, right? And that's called when you're getting into this analysis paralysis. But essentially, uh, 
trying to actually prototype out a couple of different solutions keeps you flexible, keeps you open to, po to possibilities, and it actually takes away one of the, one of the psychologies of, uh, that, that many product managers fall into is this notion of falling in love with a particular solution, and the team falls in love with a particular solution. And then <clears throat> what you're starting to do is basically ignoring the signs from customer feedback that maybe you haven't got the perfect solution yet. Whereas if you prototype out a couple of different solutions, keep it open for a little bit longer, you actually sometimes end up with a hybrid, like a better solution than you started with. So they're examples of, uh, of specific behaviors that I find uh, uh, pretty powerful for, um, for the explorer. Okay. Get yeah. this light at the end. Absolutely, okay. yes, no problem at all. And in fact, I'm going to also give you a URL because all of this is blogged. Okay. And, and, uh, and at some point, there'll be a book out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're still in this, we're still in this broad um, uh, divergent thinking mode, right? And now I've gone and flipped over to the inspect mode as well. And I call this the, the analyst mode. And this is important to make a distinction. Like as an analyst, in the analyst mode, as the way that I'm defining it, it's not about drilling into specific uh, issues or metrics. It's actually about having a desire to go and discover and learn new things about your market that you may not have known before. And that's why it's divergent. So, here it's all about understanding more about your customers and their un unmet needs. That's your goal. Is you want to learn more about the market, learn more about what competitors are doing, just learn more about and, and appreciate your target audience more. And you don't necessarily go seeking anything specifically, but you're just wanting to, to find what you can find. So you develop greater empathy. So some of the, the actual tactics that you can use. Uh, clearly, you don't, know, <laughs> you don't know what is important until you actually figure out, like, how would I measure success? So as a, as a starting point, figure out, like, what are my most important metrics for my product? Now, there is a big difference between what's called vanity metrics and what I call value metrics. Value metrics measure you actually creating value for your customer. <coughs> Vanity metrics tend to be the things that are feel good, that end up in board presentations, press releases, and generally have nothing to do whether or not you're actually delivering value for customers. Things like down mobile downloads is a vanity metric, but something like stickiness ratio, which is, say, daily active users divided by monthly active users, is more of a value metric. Uh, engagement within your product, basically. So trying to actually figure out what's important to measure here and starting to delve into the data uh, to discover where are users enjoying using my product and where are they not? Uh, are there issues? Are there ways that I can expand on what they're seeming to spend more time, uh, to, more time with? Those are the sorts of things that you start doing is you actually delve into the data and that creates new hypotheses for you to go test. It's essentially what you're trying to do. Another one is, uh, is just to go and look at and, and look at data and look at uh, different sources. Uh, some ideas for where you might be able to find just data that you just want to go and sort of delve into and explore. Any ideas? Any creative ideas? Obviously, you've got your product analytics. Anything else? Attribution. What's that? The Install attributions. So where new users are coming from, so whether that's organic search or whether that's social media. Good. Or... Good. Trying to figure out where people are actually coming from, so your different channels. What else? Competitors. Competitors? Yeah, exactly. Benchmarking against competitors. It's, it's very, very powerful. Um, one of my favorite is actually just to get my customer service or customer uh, uh, service department to just put 10 emails together for me each week and send them to me about my product. And I'm learning like what people are actually saying and I'm like noticing issues or I'm noticing trends or uh, just sort of getting that, that, again, that empathy built up. 
Uh, uh, one of the most important, though, is you, as product manager, cannot <coughs> outsource actually going and talking to customers. And I cannot, I, I'm astounded the number of product managers that do that. That they wait for the user experience group or the consumer insights group to go and give them research and give them a report on what's going on. Okay? There, you cannot, you have to get out of the building. And you have to go set this up. And don't be afraid of messing it up and talking to a customer about like something on your roadmap. I mean, you've got to be a little bit careful. You don't make commitments. But generally, I think people are more scared about talking to customers than, than, than not. Uh, and you might actually run into barriers because you may not have built the trust in your organization yet to get permission to do this. And so generally, the barriers might come from sales. Don't talk to my customers. Right, you're going to mess this up for me. Or it might also happen um, that you actually have a consumer research group and they say their job is to do all this. Don't, don't uh, leverage them, but don't outsource it entirely. Unless you're sitting there with the customers, you're not going to notice the little like um, subtle first person things that are going to happen. You're not going to see that, you, you will not see the body language. You will not hear them say something that you actually connect and say, wait, that's actually about something else. In, if you wait till you get a report back, that's all secondhand and the conclusions could be wrong and you just don't have enough, uh, enough data. I actually recommend that for consumer uh, products, and this is a really big ask, but every two weeks you, if you, you've actually talked to five users. It's a lot. Now there is an easy way to do this. You don't need focus groups. In fact, I, I hate focus groups. One of the biggest reasons is because you just get that group think going on and no, you can't really trust any of the data. Uh, you don't need even really to over plan those because the idea is you're not getting statistically useful information here. You're observing, you're building empathy, you're getting directionally useful clues to how you might be able to improve your product. And that's what that's all about. So bringing five people in, giving them a Starbucks card, if you can, uh, then that's, that's enough, half an hour with each of those. The other thing is this word here, observe. So it's not, that's not about like, here's my product, can you use it and tell me you know, usability issues. You actually start much broader than that. Who are you? What's important in your life? How do you solve this problem today? Um, how many kids do you have? Like what, what are some of the demands on your time and, and money? And you, you shrink in from there to get more and more specific about the value that they find in the product, and ultimately testing the product itself. So you want to start very broad. So it's all about that very broad understanding and, and trying to pick up on clues. Now, over time, if you do five every two weeks, over a year, you've talked to so many customers, you're the expert, and you're going to know so much about their world and how your product fits into it that you'll, you, you, you'll be able to make much, much more confident de uh, decisions. Just Please. A question. What's the difference between the data you'd be gather gathering from existing customers or people who, who didn't download? Perfect. Yes. That's a, you, you, thank you for reminding me. So there are about five different types of customers that you need to like, think about here. So you have your uh, actual customers, but they're actually going to break down into loyal customers as well as people who are uh, early users of your product. Then you've got people who are coming to use your product for the first time, first time users. Their expectations and how far they are down the funnel is so different that unless your product is doing a good job of communicating the value proposition and onboarding them, they're not going to get any further. And their needs are going to be completely different than someone who's been using your product for like two years. And then you've got users that stopped using your product. Sorry, I didn't find value in it. Why? And that's where you're going to, I think, find a lot of really interesting insights. Then you also should talk to your competitors, users. So go talk to them and find out relatively why they value the competitor product over yours and sort of see if, is there, if there's something that you can learn from that. So they're just some examples. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank so it was, you. A, it was about like the different types of customers. And then finally, uh, Yes. What if your customers is very closed group? Very what? Very, very closed group? Like, let's say, uh, 
<laughs> okay, so what happens if your customers are prisoners or a very, very close group or a hard to reach, to reach group? Or conversely, in enterprise, it's often much more complicated to set up you know, interviews with the various stakeholders in the enterprise. They're very busy. Uh, and there's a lot less of them that you can go to. So a couple of things to do. So if, you're, if your product is, for example, prisoners, then you, you will need to go to extra lengths to get access to those, but it's, it's going to be totally worth it. And maybe they're not going to come and visit you. <laughs> uh, but more, more realistically, what, what I think you'll find is if you go to them, OK, you're not going to do five every two weeks, but, but every product manager, like how many uh, of the people who are product managers who want to admit this have actually visited a customer in the last month? Yeah, one, one person. Okay, so that, that, would be, that would freak me out as VP of product anywhere. Okay, I would want every product manager on my team to be visiting at least one every month. Sometimes you can do them in a, in a little bit of a group, but that constant cadence is, is, is super important. And you just got to break down the barriers to, to reach them. Uh, then uh, another, another technique is to, to go virtual. So it's okay to do things like usertesting.com or to, uh, to video conference or something like that. Right? So I would, I would break down the barriers. The key is make it simple so you're not spending so much time planning that it becomes so overwhelming that you stop doing it. That's, what I, that's the cycle, the vicious cycle I'm trying to break here. So the more simple you can make it, even if you're worried that maybe I'm not getting the most detailed data back, it's okay. It's more important to talk to them because you're, you're, you will get to know them pretty, pretty well. In enterprise, by the way, another, another really great technique is to put together a product council and, or a customer council, uh, more accurately. And these are 20 or so companies that are somewhat friendlies, but they also understand that in exchange for things like early releases, betas, those sorts of things, they have to be open and frank with you about what, what's working, and they need to give you access. And you can negotiate that. Uh, it, might take a little bit of finesse, but generally sales organizations will be thrilled because uh, it sets up another layer of a relationship that, that a competitor, for example, doesn't have. And that gives you then access to go and actually show them new things and get them very excited. And generally, that works very well for an organization. And the reason why I picked 20 is because you don't want to go back to the well over and over again. So you go and talk to three you know, every month or so, and so over a course of a year, you've talked to maybe them once or twice each. Sound good? Yeah. One last yeah. question. Are there any tools to know, like, what was the last interaction with your product before a person deletes the app or something? Uh, not off the top of my head that I know of, but I'm sure there is. Okay. Um, and that sounds like a business opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, does, anyone have any, does anyone know of any tools that does that? Cool, uh, and, but but again, I don't I, I don't over do, don't overcomplicate it. Like that could be useful statistically, but I think you could easily talk to six people and get a sense for what was the last thing that happened. Mm -hmm. I had a case like this uh, for a mobile messaging product that was actually predates what WhatsApp, and it, but it was doing basically the same thing. And the uh, we had this really great loyal user base, and then suddenly they would just stop using the product. Talk to them. And very quickly realized that uh, for some reason we we're losing or, or failing to deliver one in like 400 messages. But it just ha has to happen once, and then you destroy all the trust. And so, as we talked through what we thought was a pretty good success rate for a product that was actually really quite difficult to get working pre iPhone and, and Android, um, that was enough to destroy trust, and they would just turn off and. and actually stop, not even tell their, their friends about it. So we learned that without having to have too much of the, the analytics. But we did not know that. We did not know that for, for like six months at least. And until we noticed the trend, because we went to the analysts and started to notice this trend, and then went and talked to them. Yeah. The very final thing on this one, and I'm mindful of time, so please uh, keep me, uh, where's, where's, where are you? He's not there. I'll, we'll keep on going while you're enjoying it, um, is, again, uh, don't outsource all, all of your analytics. Sorry if you're a Google Analytics uh, fan boy or girl, 
Uh, the canned reports are useless. They don't tell you anything about your product, really. They, they give you some highlights and they're, they're, they're kind of, they can be pretty engaging, but unless you equip yourself to dig into the data, dice and slice raw data if you have to, learn basics of Excel, learn how to do your own basic SQL commands, ask for access to raw data, or work and make a friend with people in data anal analytics. The reason is, is that uh, it, you don't really, it's very hard to ask the perfectly right question up front. And so you go, you go up to another team and say, can you make me a report that gives me the answer to this? And guaranteed they'll get it to you like two weeks later instead of like the two hours that it can take you to build something quick and dirty. And, uh, and they've got lots of demands on their time. Finance want this. So they suddenly go into this queue and it all slows it down. And you cannot iterate around that data. It's like, oh, the report came back, but now I have four more questions that came from that. So you don't want to get into that cycle. You really want to get access and, and a sort of this uh, quant kind of ability, core ability, to dig in there and answer a lot of your own questions. Now, obviously, before you make life-changing decisions that bet the company on something, you want much more rigorous analysis. But generally, 80-20 kind of analysis, quick and dirty analysis, will tell you a lot. And you can learn so much quicker and, and sort of test hypotheses and sort of see what's, what's going on. All right. Challenger mode. Now we're flipping to convergent. So I'm focusing and uh, we're still on kind of that inspect mode. I like the challenger mode because basically this is all about uh, fighting and combating your own uh, uh, cognitive biases. You, uh, you're being your own devil's advocate. Okay. Now what you're really trying to do is to find flaws, risks, assumptions, so you can de-risk your project and make it stronger. So I'm not saying this is not necessarily how it kills an idea, it's how it makes it stronger, because you, you preempt a lot of those issues that might come up later. Uh, but yes, it can also kill off ideas. So th the challenger mode is really about trying to uh, make sure you're not falling into the trap of confirmation bias, is one. Confirmation bias, where you only look for data that confirms your opinion. The, uh, and I've got five biases that product managers fall into. Uh, confirmation bias. The second is known as reputation bias. You fall in love with an idea, you've been promoting that idea, and now your personal reputation is on the line for the success of that idea. That's bad, because you're going to do whatever it takes to get the product out or the idea out, and you're going to look at metrics that support your, your success. So you want to fight against that too. Uh, authority bias. The CEO said we need to build this, therefore we're building it. We jump and all through the hoops and we don't actually go and challenge the idea. You've got to fight against that. And yes, that requires tact uh, and, and uh, some high emotional intelligence. Uh, the third is groupthink. So as your team get into the pro product, you start feeding off each other. So you have to come in with like, what if we're wrong? And actually get other people to think about it. And the final is sunk cost fallacy. What? Sunk cost fallacy. Okay. Sunk cost fallacy is we've been working on this project for six months and it's not seeming to work that great, but we're going to keep on going anyway because we've already invested six months of our time in it. Okay? Cut your losses. If something doesn't look like it's going to work, don't be afraid to cut your losses. So they're the five. I do have a slide in this, uh, in the appendix to, to take that away. So one of the great, great, great ways to fight against the psychology is start with assuming that everything you're doing is a hypothesis and it requires validation. You do not know I have an opinion. And I have a hypothesis that obviously requires testing and validation. One of my favorite it's really hard to do. Everyone has an engineer on their team that is this person or someone in marketing or sometimes even a customer who just always finds the problems with everything. All right? Always like brings me down every time I'm talking, talking to them. Fight against that. Go and embrace them. 
They're a fantastic resource. They'll find and they'll pick the problems. You know the problem finders? They're not problem solvers. They're problem finders, right? <laughs> and we hate that. But go and embrace them because they're going to help you find those little things that can bring your product down. Communicate equally the things that are concerning you, negative outcomes, tests that failed, metrics that are off. And finally, don't forget your job isn't to, to decide just on what to do. Your job is to also decide on what not to do. Use the challenger mode to cut things out. Put them into an idea backlog is fine. Say you're going to go get to them later. Put them on the roadmap 18 months from now. They're all good ways of making sure they will never get done. So don't be afraid. <laughs> You've got to focus, prioritize, cut, because your job here is to get your team laser focused on the highest potential value ideas that you can deliver for your customers. And finally, evangelist. Yes, your job is to be an evangelist. This terrifies me. Believe it or not, I'm actually pretty terrified of public speaking. I, uh, I, I've done uh, pretty hostile audiences in my own companies, announcing changes in the product roadmap. Uh, to 400 people and like they're literally I'm expecting tomatoes at me. So really the evangelist mindset is, is something that your job is to build momentum. So we're back to the possibilities, imagining big, delivering on that vision, but now we're focused. So you have to be laser focused on what, what is the thing that we want to achieve? How do I motivate the team to get there? How do I build support broadly? within my organization to get there. Some of the tactics. Buy-in. Don't ever underestimate it. Communicate regularly, emails weekly, uh, go meet with lots of different stakeholders. Even after your project has been approved, you want to make sure they know where it is at, what the value, remind them why, why you are doing it as a company, and continue to sort of get that, not over, over the line, but even once it's in, um, in market. It's actually particularly important if you need support from marketing and sales once you've launched something. So you want to really get out there uh, and don't underestimate that and you can't do it at the end. Happy hours are good for that. Happy hours are great. Happy hours are great. One-on-one -on -one meetings are great. People have different um, preferences in their communication style. So some people um, just want updates over the water cooler. Some people just want updates when things are not going according to plan. So they're not surprised. Others want kind of an email, like little like summary, executive summary. Some people want reports. Some people want you to come and meet with them like for you know, 30 minutes. So you have to kind of like be a little sensitive to different, different uh, communication styles. One of the other things about this is you are often further ahead of your team than others are. Like, so you're, sorry, you're, you're further ahead of your team. So you've already come to conclusions about why a customer needs something, why that feature is a higher pro pro uh, uh, priority than, than the other feature, or why this particular solution is the one that we're going to use because it tested well. Okay? So don't forget to let your team catch up to you. Share the data. Spend the time talking to them about your decision-making process, not just prescribe them the decision you've made. Because if they can look at the same kind of body of work that you've been looking at and, and arrive at the same decision, then that's going to save you a lot of heartache in the long run because they're very much bought into it. But if you try to sprint out ahead of them, you'll actually find they, they can actually get quite resistant they don't have the context anymore. They don't understand where your head's at. And you get very, very frustrated. So that's why context is really, really key. Don't prescribe a solution. I mean, obviously, you influence the solution. Obviously, you have a big say in what, how you're going to solve a problem for a customer. But, it, but balance that out with sharing data, sharing company goals, reminding people of the company goals, reminding of them how they fit into the company goals. This project is doing this. And our goals this quarter were that. That's how that maps back. So don't, don't, uh, don't overlook that. One of my other favorite techniques, take them along with you for customer interviews. Take your team. They build, they build the same empathy. They see the same problems. They often want to come back and fix them immediately. So that's just some examples. There's a whole lot more that um, I can point you to some resources on 
context setting as a bigger part of, of managing through influence, which I'm sure you've seen, which is a total other talk. And then finally, this, is, this can be hard too, particularly if you're kind of new at the game. Don't be afraid to lose ownership. So you may, you may actually step back from prescribing the solution. Uh, you may let them go ahead and do things slightly different than you would have. And importantly, when something is success, you're not the one up on stage. You let your team have the glory. Now, if something goes wrong, you're up on stage. Right? But you have to be mature enough to let uh, the team succeed and uh, let them own as much as you can let them own because the, the momentum that they will get, they will build more momentum. And so what if they're occasionally wrong? You can, that's the great thing about iteration these days is you can fix that. So that's basically it. They're my mindsets. So I will skip these because I've talked uh, to, about them uh, already. But I will just pick uh, one, is uh, discarding your intuition. So whatever you do, balance data with this. Don't say, I'm only going to look at data. I'm only going to look at like, the, what comes out of this. So when you actually get to a point where, even if the data is not really showing you conclusively that you're on the right track, keep a healthy degree of, of, of your intuition alive and keep going forward and being okay with, uh, with only giving up uh, if maybe you know, after three times you've tried and you can't make it work. Then give up. Uh, I talked about these and then, uh, do we have time? We do. We do? Good. So now uh, I would like everyone to think a little bit about applying these. And I've noticed that, certainly in myself, that I'm going to be stronger in some of these than others. Okay? So I'm not saying you have to be perfect at all of this for a product manager. I'm actually pretty poor at this. I, 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 I consider myself a creative person, but I always need other people around me to like, get the ideas really going and bouncing off each other. Strong at that, and I've developed over time how to be more of an evangelist after some shocking product failures <laughs> and realizing that it wasn't actually the, pr the product that was totally wrong, but it was, it was because that I um, was pushing my team and telling them what to do too much and really uh, at the end of the day we didn't have the best solution. So I've learned, but uh, each of you are going to have uh, some challenges somewhere here. So what I'd love to do, oh, and the other thing is uh, you are also, you, you want to also be aware of what are the dominant types of people around you because you have to balance. Here's a great textbook case. Working with entrepreneurs, founders of companies, which I have done a, a ton of, I have discovered that they're all here. They're all up there. They are just idea generators. And in fact, if you expose that like in a short circuit to an engineering team, then at any point in time you never know what the engineers are really working on because they've they're been they're being tasked with a different priority that day and then half of them quit and some of them, yeah, whatever. So, so uh, my deliberate strategy was to balance that, that, those people out by always making sure they were present during the kind of that explorations phase idea generating. Sometimes I would just go, we would just whiteboard things and talk about ideas and that would be enough for them to say, oh great, I've communicated their idea, it's done and they'll move on to the next idea and it may never get built but it may. It may. Uh, whereas what I had to do was to really balance them out by putting the ideas through their paces, analyzing, understanding, does this even fit with like a customer need and then really coming up with like, okay, well we heard all the reasons why this is a good idea, what are the risks? So balancing other people out is important too. And that you might find that with engineers. They might be all here. Uh, you might find that with, uh, with a certain, uh, like a, a salesperson or something might be all here. So you want to sort of think about like, okay, what, what, what does my team need? So let's do one final thing. And that is this exercise. 
So I say take out a piece of paper, but I've realized that we're in the 21st century now. We don't need paper. Okay. So uh, on your phone, maybe, uh, imagine the four quadrants. They are explorer, analyst, challenger, and evangelist. Pick one as your go-to strength. This is the thing that I'm just good at. I, I feel natural, the most natural. We can always learn, but it's the thing that I feel I'm, I'm going to be the most ma natural at. Then, then identify another that you think your team member, a key team member you work with, or a manager, or if, if you aren't in a team, like your partner, I don't know. Any, but, but think about like what they do, and then come up with a strategy, just one behavior that you will do to uh, balance out their tendencies. So what will you overcompensate with? And then the final thing is, identify in one of the quadrants that you didn't <coughs> circle as your own strength, something that you learned today that you would actually like to apply to practice getting better at it. Do I need to repeat that or are we good? Okay, go for it. Yes, I will show you the quadrant. Do you have all this? So check the, check the thing you're good at, identify something you want to practice in one of the other quadrants to get better, and then figure out a strategy for compensating for the strength of, uh, of others that might overwhelm if you weren't, weren't careful. And here are the quadrants again. Great. I won't call on you like I would with my students. Mm -hmm. Mutual therapy. <coughs> I'll just give you another minute. You probably know, so just go with what you first came into your, into your head. All right, 30 more seconds. And if you're having trouble, I'll be around afterwards so we can happy, happy to chat, give you some, uh, some ideas. Okay, good. I'm going to finish it there. I think we've asked a couple of questions as we go. Uh, this is my, my website. Uh, I've actually posted just uh, last month a very detailed breakdown that's even more detailed than these slides. We will give you also the access to the slides. Here's my email address. Please don't hesitate to reach out. I, I love networking and meeting new people and I'm happy uh, as time allows to sort of uh, bounce around some ideas with you. Uh, and uh, thank you very much. And I, I don't know if we want some more question time uh, or are we at time? No, yeah, we can, have, we can have some questions. Okay, great. Are there any other questions? Although I felt some of these questions were great that came up as we go. Yes? Yeah, I was just wondering, um, how do you justify your intuition when you're seeking buy-in from your team? Uh, how do you justify your intuition when you're seeking buy-in your, from your team? It's a really, really great, uh, uh, really great point. So, uh, first of all, if your intuition is completely at odds with every piece of evidence, you're not going to have much luck, right? But your intuition needs to be communicated in a way that is rational. And you can be asserting uh, an end outcome, a vision. You can be talking, getting them excited about what, uh, what, what could possibly be true. Uh, you could talk about the, the, the problems that you're going to solve for the customer, even though it seems like maybe sometimes you're not sure. Uh, just sort of getting that, getting that message out there. Being clear that it's an opinion, but having a very clear kind of rationale, is, particularly when you're talking to, uh, say, uh, people you're going to ask to sell it or people who you're going to ask to build it, still you have to have very clear like ideas about why it's important, but maybe you don't, what I'm saying is don't not 
communicate that just because you don't yet have the data. You will get stuck otherwise. You'll get stuck in, in analyzing everything and you won't make, make it very far. A second technique is when you feel like you don't have 100% buy-in, go for lower stakes. So I would recommend talking to stakeholders about investing in a prototype as opposed to a whole project or running a test and getting some buy-in there. And then the investment levels and what you're asking people to do, they might roll eyes and say, okay, we'll do it. But basically, you've, you've taken the, the high-stakes stuff off the table. Great. Yes? Uh, one of the common PM biases you mentioned was authority bias, where the CEO has this grand idea. Um, what are some effective strategies that you found to um, respond to that with tact, as you mentioned? <laughs> right. So the question is, um, with the, within these biases, one of the one of the things that, uh, or one of the biases that product managers fall into a lot is authority bias, which is a, a, essentially someone more senior than you, or someone in more in a, posi a position of power, or a position where they're perceived as an expert. Are, are, are quite common, um, though they assert something as a priority or something we're going to go do. And particularly if you're very junior, you don't feel like you're in a place to push back or you actually just skip into implementing it because that's, they're, clearly, they're clearly experts so we, don't, we can skip all of this challenging and analyzing stuff. Uh, but the problem is that even experts can be wrong. In fact, I think definition of, uh, of people who are wrong are experts. So I, uh, I'm probably one of them. But uh, what, what to do? Okay, so tact is, is critical. So the first, the first thing I would do is, great idea. Can we get in a room and talk about this more? And get people engaged, get yourself engaged in it, and you might get convinced that it's a great idea. Or maybe during the conversations you start asking just enough questions that raise really good questions around like whether or not this is really something we want to do. So, Collaborate is actually, bizarrely, the, the first strategy. Don't try to bat it away, actually embrace it, but try to influence what, what the, where the conversation goes. And that's not that hard to do. Like, you know, it's really just about talking and asking questions. Uh, do, certainly don't, don't immediately show you're, you're, you're not actually on board because that will be perceived as that you're, you're a barrier and you're trying to, you're not being very objective, you're trying to stop something. You want to actually get on, get on the train, but try, try to actually get, uh, get the conversation going. So maybe they say, you know what, well, now I'm thinking about this, it doesn't quite make as much sense as we thought. Or that's, they're really good questions, maybe we should slow down and figure a few of those things out first. That's kind of what you're looking for. The, the second, uh, really good second technique is great idea, what goal is that going for? Oh, so what's changed in our priorities then? Between when we set our priorities around this business goal and this idea, has something changed that I'm not aware of? Because that goal is not what we agreed to a month ago. And now you're basically asking for context. And if there's been a true change in priorities, then that's good to know. Or quite often it'll be like, yeah, okay, so you're saying that, yeah, you're right, we did set that as a priority, so maybe this should be lower in the, in the order. Um, and then uh, you know, another, another technique is uh, to take the idea and put it in the backlog and show where it is. Yes, this is on the roadmap, but reminding you that we have these three or four key things that we've committed to, so it's here. Are we all on the same page there? So showing that it's actually not just disappeared into thin air is important. So I call this kind of saying no nicely. Uh, there's, of course, uh, tons of other uh, techniques, but you get the gist that the, it's, it's about leaning in uh, and, and collaborating with people as opposed to sort of trying to, to, to block it. That said, uh, there are times where you actually have to just say no. 
and it, you can, so you're not doing that too often and you have the, the organizational like respect, it's okay to go to the salesperson, for example, and say, yes, the customer does want that and I know you've sold it, but we just, not, we just cannot do it. And so let's think of a strategy for a, a workaround or going back and talking to the customer. And so you do need to be strong sometimes, but you, you, you kind of want to always show that you're doing it in the interest of the business. Great, great question. Yeah. Yeah, I have two questions regarding out of like interview with customers. So the first question is like, uh, how do, do I know like I'm asking the right questions? So like basically we have like five type of customers we want to interview. Like should we prepare different questionnaire for each? Uh, and second question uh, is regarding of the sample set. So how do I know like I'm, I'm asking enough people to make a decision? Like, Got it. So there's a whole body of work about uh, you know, interview like best practices, and uh, I, I would actually look at uh, at that, and I would talk to my user experience group or consumer insights group because product managers we're not really trained in that kind of uh, the how to how to really ask those questions that are not going to lead people, um, but. Good product managers over time kind of learn that and, and if you're in a very small company then probably you are in charge of talking to customers. But the, gen the general rule is uh, you, you want to ask open-ended questions. So you're not asking a bad question if, you, if a conversation starts. You could be asking like something that doesn't seem even relevant and that can lead to an insight. So don't be afraid of just asking nice open-ended questions and ha having them talk and, and answer you, and then you probe, sort of drill in on a couple of those. So why is that? Why do you think that? Or why is that important to you? And you might even do that a couple of times. So you, you, the ba bad open-ended questions are like, or bad questions are kind of closed, like they are a yes or no answer, or a maybe answer, that don't lead to a conversation, and you can't probe on, right? So that's, that's one of the most uh, critical things. Then another, another really important thing is to be very, very mindful of what biases you're, you're showing them. When you're, you know, what are you fishing for in terms of an answer? So, for example, one of the ones that would be, you, you'd think is, is, is uh, pretty uh, fine to ask is, what do you like about this product? Okay? So the problem is, is that you're actually biasing them to like something in your product. And they may actually hate your product, or they may actually like your product and like certain things about your product, but they're not very important to them. So a better question would be, what do you like or dislike about the product? Or what are your, your opinions about the product? So you're trying to get a little bit more neutral, and then um, follow up with, Okay, so you like this, this, or this, or you, you dislike this or this. How important are those things? Can you actually rank them for me? Because then you'll get a sense of, oh, you know, the five things I dislike are actually the most important things, and the five things I like are actually I don't care. Right? So you want to sort of get that kind of sophistication. Now, I'll stop there because I don't want to get too much into the, into the details about interview techniques. Uh, actually, there is one, one more thing. But you don't. Uh, but generally, look for uh, and do some research and try to partner with somebody who's who's an expert in it um, before you do it yourself. The, the 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 last thing I'll say is the this sort of onion model. Imagine you're starting super broad, very very generic about them, and you're slowly working your way into your product, not the other way around. Because what happens is if you introduce even what your product does then you've completely changed the conversation that you're going to have because they've got bias now on, oh, this person is wanting to speak to me about this problem and then everything they talk about is going to be this problem rather than like uh, more about them and their life and the opportunities and where your problem fits into or where your product fits into that. Uh, how are we doing? Yeah, we're going to do two more questions. Two more? Well, we'll do the two front, uh, two front rowers. Thank you for sitting in the front row, by the way. I actually have a trick that I usually leave like a, a row of chairs fairly close to me and people like fill up that leave the front ones and then they just take the, take the front way, <laughs> row away. And we have the front row and it looks full and everything. Yeah. So how do you debundle what happens with the tech product 
and what's happening in the offline world. Imagine like Uber, you like there is the experience you're having with the app, and then the experience you're having in the so people who dislike Uber, it can be uh -huh. the app or it can be because the driver was not great. Uh -huh. So the question is about unbundling the online and offline experience and sort of how you how you think about that. And so the very first thing is the total customer experience is your problem. So there is no such thing as the online experience and the offline experience, it's the total customer experience. It is your problem if they're having a bad experience in the cab or the, in the car uh, because it's not clean or something like that. You can solve that by certain online solutions and you can solve it by incentives and you can solve it uh, by rules, by how you interview drivers. That's still your product. And so don't don't ignore the offline overall the experience. Should capture that. Absolutely, absolutely. And when you ask things like NPS, you don't say do you, how much do you like the website. You ask how much do you like the product. So, so you you as a product manager need to be thinking about that total customer experience for the simple reason that your customers don't think any differently. Okay. Now it does mean that maybe you have to come up with non-technical solutions to it. And so that's where a product manager in that, in that world needs to have influence over things other than just like getting an engineering team to build something. They need to be able to implement other kind of, uh, other kind of experiences. But everything down to writing the terms of service, how are we interviewing drivers, uh, what are the, what are, what are, what's the reputation model for drivers, how do we rank them. And some, some parts of technology will come into that, and other times it won't be you know, that much technology. Great. Um, I love the idea of the product council, but I can see how it might be a problem getting buy-in both internally and externally. Do you have any suggestions? So the question is about, uh, I, I kind of misspoke a little bit there. Customer councils is kind of what I'm talking about there. So um, the, the custom, question is about how do you sort of build a customer council, getting buy-in from people internally. Uh, that, 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 can, that can be a lot of friction. So good, good question. I've run into this every place I've gone, particularly where product is a new function and sales or marketing have been typically the people that are talking to users or customers, and it, it can be a bit of a bear. So the, the first thing is, is go slow. So you don't need to build a customer council overnight. You don't need 20 overnight. Ask for one, because <laughs> one's better than zero, right? And two's better than one, right? Mathematical genius. Mm -hmm. So it's all about like starting to build up and getting momentum. And then you are absolutely, you actually do two very critical things. The first is, is that you include the people who might be resistant in the engagement. So you bring them along, they can sit there. I've had meetings where sales have been in the room and they've kind of tried to flip back into sales mode or they've tried to put me on the spot. You've got to be very careful with that. Like, so that means we're going to commit to this, right? I'm like, no, I didn't say that. <laughs> but generally having them in the room, even if it's a little bit less uh, comfortable, uh, shows that, you're, that you can be responsible to, uh, and be trusted. And they see that firsthand, and, then, they, and then, then you follow up with them and say, this is what I learned. This is why this is important. This is the changes that you've helped me uh, generate because you've allowed me to, to talk to customers. So again, you're building very carefully. Um, and then the, uh, the, the third thing is, is you, it's a product, you've got to sell it. So you evangelize the product council or the, the customer council like you would any other. Why is this important? Uh, why do I need access? And uh, essentially create some rules of engagement as well. So we're not going to, like, I, in, ideally I'd like to be able to ask customers why they stopped buying the product. It just may happen that the answer is, oh, I love the product, I can't stand the salesperson. Right? <laughs> so you don't want to ask that question. <laughs> right? So you kind of like, what are the rules of engagement that I, I'm going to be tactful and I'm not going to maybe shine a light where it shouldn't be shone, not because that's a bad thing. In fact, it, you, want bad, you want lights to be shone on broken things in sales and in content. I had that happen at lynda.com. We came up with all sorts of problems that, in the sales team and content. But the reality is, is that 
by the time we got to that point, people really trusted the process and they could see it was very objective, no one was getting blamed, and uh, I wasn't destroying like the entire sales pipeline. Great. Thank you.